let us uh, look at uh, BCS theory, uh, the burden cooper schrieffer theory, the first uh, microscopic theory of superconductivity, uh, which was extremely successful in uh, describing the behavior and the properties of the conventional superconductors, which are also known as weak coupling superconductors. So, I said that uh, it was uh, the first microscopic theory and it was form formulated by Burden, Cooper and Schiffer and that is why the name BCS came in 1957, so which was approximately 50 years after the discovery of superconductivity experimentally, which as we have seen before uh, that it was uh, done by Kamerling Owens in 1908. Uh, this theory successfully describes the superconducting properties of weak coupling superconductors. Uh, we will try to make it clear that what uh, weak coupling, the word weak coupling uh, means uh, such as uh, aluminum and uh, other uh, materials, mostly they are metals and not all metals form uh, or give rise to superconductivity, but there are certain metals which give. This also we will discuss uh, which are uh, the potential candidates for superconductivity. So, the basic idea is that the electrons lying within a Debye energy of a filled Fermi C. Okay. So, there are two electrons are needed and they are lying within the Debye uh, frequency or Debye energy of a filled Fermi C in a metal, they can form bound pairs. See, this is something that has to be contrasted from the usual behavior of electrons uh, which would repel each other. However, if you can create a situation in which they are uh, in a very close proximity of a filled Fermi C, uh, the electrons do not interact with the Fermi C other than by exclusion principle and then these two electrons actually can uh, have an attractive interaction between them and can form bound pairs. Uh, and it is important to say that not all electrons participate in pairing and only the electrons which are in the vicinity of the Fermi surfaces do, not in the uh, say the near the center of the Fermi surface, uh, they do not take part in pairing, but it is only which lie in the vicinity of the Fermi surface or close to the Fermi energy they do. This paired state requires a many body description and this is what is the central focus of our discussion at least uh, for this one and a discussion that is going to be held after this. Uh, now, this hint that the Debye energy scale is important for this problem, it actually signals that there is an involvement of electron phonon interaction and this was proposed by Froelich as early as 1950. So, before this theory came up. Now, this electron uh, phonon interaction describes uh, isotope effect, just give me a, a minute to say what that is. So, the dependence on the, uh, sorry this should be phonon, on the phonon parameters were experimentally demonstrated by the fact that the transition temperature, we have seen this concept of transition temperature a temperature that divides a uh, superconducting state with that of a non superconducting one or, or rather a metallic state. The temperature at which this transition occurs is called as a superconducting transition temperature. So, this transition temperature T c becomes a function of the ionic mass of uh, different isotopes of the same metal. Now, that tells that if that happens then the lattice uh, because the ions are involved and hence the lattice is involved and then uh, the, uh, the phonons are involved as well. And uh, this is an experimental demonstration of an electron phonon interaction or the rather the phonons are playing an important role in the whole process. So, if you uh, want to write this, this uh, goes as a delta T c over T c, this is equal to a minus half. Uh, delta m over m, where um, m is an ionic mass and delta m is uh, uh, the difference in ionic masses of uh, two isotopes or uh, very simply this is uh, 
written as uh, T c to be a function of uh, uh, you know 1 by square root of m, where m being the uh, ionic mass. So, these are uh, experimental demonstration that the phonons are involved and which is also central to the discussion that we are going to have. So, uh, coming to the success of the BCS theory a priori of course, we have not uh, talked about BCS theory yet, but it is important to know that uh, why should we be doing it in a course like this. Uh, there are many successes in fact, uh, it is uh, it gives uh, the excitation energy uh, gap the energy gap so called uh, in a superconductor there is certain amount of energy that is required to be supplied to the superconductor in order to break the or rather the break the Cooper pairs and uh, promote them to the excited state. So, this is uh, done experimentally uh, done by the electron tunneling uh, which was done by Gever in uh, 1960. Uh, so, when an electron uh, is sent across a metal in uh, metal superconductor junction, uh, the superconducting energy gap 2 delta, uh, sh it should not have uh, been able to pass through, because there is a, a additional barrier that uh, is, um, is there, uh, which the electron uh, which the metallic side does not have. But however, uh, there is a process called as an Andreev reflection, which we are not going to discuss here. Uh, and because of that Andreev reflection, there is a pair, if not the electron, there is a pair that can uh, propagate into the superconducting region. Uh, and uh, this shows up in a peak, which is called as the Andreev peak. And this happens just below the uh, energy uh, of the excitation energy of the, of the gap of a superconductor and hence it is um, it gives these electron tunneling measurements uh, they yield the magnitude of the gap. And there are other experiments which actually probe the symmetry of the gap the symmetry of the gap in the momentum space. So, to say uh, it explains Meissner effect we have seen extensively what Meissner effect is it explains the specific heat jump uh, it explains isotope effect as we have seen. And uh, the important books in this uh, context are Parks, R. D. Parks, he had two volumes of uh, superconductivity, which were published in uh, 1969. And then there is a Rikaisen, which uh, there, there is a book uh, by Rikaisen, which was uh, uh, in 1965, and then this book by Schriffer in 1964. Uh, one of the uh, proposers of BCS theory. So, what exactly is happening? How are the electrons interacting with themselves via an attractive interaction, uh, via an attractive potential such that they form bound pairs? And uh, what do these bound pairs have uh, in common with the superconducting state? So, uh, it can be understood as the instability of the Fermi gas. So, what happens is that the ground state of the free Fermi gas as we said that this corresponds to the filled Fermi sphere uh, corresponds to all completely filled states up to the Fermi level and all states beyond the Fermi energy they are all empty. This is the definition of the Fermi distribution function, but this Fermi gas is going to get unstable. Um, against the formation of at least one bound pair irrespective of regardless of how weak the interaction is so long it is attractive. And this is was uh, known as Cooper's instability. So, to rephrase this we have a filled Fermi uh, C or a Fermi sphere. If by some means what means we are going to uh, discuss just in a while if by some means the two electrons form bound pair in the vicinity of that Fermi sphere lying within the energy scale, which is given by the phonon frequency or phonon energy. Then this Fermi gas, the free Fermi gas is going to be unstable and this is called as the Cooper's instability. 
to see how such attractive interactions come about. Now, consider two electrons added to a uh, filled Fermi C. The electrons interact with each other, but not with the Fermi C except via the exclusion principle. Uh, one uh, sort of hand waving way of seeing it is that uh, suppose you have a horse moving through a dusty field and when it uh, runs through the dusty field, uh, it uh, gathers a lot of dust around it and anybody uh, say another horse would not see that horse, but would see a cloud of dust that is moving forward. And pretty much something similar to that is happening that an electron passes through the, um, the lattice and uh, because of these uh, the ions being present, this picks up enough positive charge that it looks for another electron it looks like a positive charge uh, and uh, they form bound pairs. Now, it could also uh, be argued that why does not the uh, this other electron also is perceived as a cloud of positive charge which when they will repel and we will see that uh, this happens at different uh, time scales and that is why there is not enough time that both of them would be uh, like an ionic cloud moving together and uh, they would repel rather uh, it happens at a shorter line time scale that uh, the, uh, the electron one electron sees the other ionic cloud and gets attracted towards and forms a bound pair. But this is just a hand waving way of seeing uh, looking at it we will see this more carefully. So, as has been told that the first uh, hunch or the inkling of the BCS theory what was put forward by Cooper in 1956 just a year ahead of the discovery of BCS theory. So, he pointed out uh, that a normal metal um, will become unstable to the formation of pairs. Uh, if uh, the I mean no matter how small the attractive interaction between the pair is and uh, so he proposed that such pairing would be preceded or would be facilitated by the presence of the lattice and hence phonons. So, the electrons would uh, scatter in a particular way. and the electron electron interaction in presence of phonons is given by I will explain what uh, all these quantities are. So, the first term is the screened Coulomb potential. and it is always uh, positive and re hence repulsive. So, in no way that uh, this term can give rise to um, uh, an attractive interaction the first term. Now, the second term is uh, generally weaker than the first term.
and uh, caused by electron phonon interaction uh, the strength of which is given by m q. Uh, <coughs> now, this term can become negative if uh, omega square is less than omega d square. So, in general this uh, the frequencies lie around the Debye frequency as has been told earlier. So, in a small range that in the vicinity of omega d if omega becomes less than omega d the energy denominator becomes small and negative. So, the whole interaction term or this whole second term becomes negative and large and this can cause superconductivity. So, it will happen in a thus I mean V s q omega. Now, when uh, the second term actually takes over the first term the second term being negative uh, then the whole interaction can become negative uh, in the vicinity. of the of uh, omega d. Okay. So, it is possible that the two electrons uh, to bind if they construct a relative wave function which selectively uses a frequency range that is given by. So, if you plot this then it looks like that it is So, this is a V s q omega and this is omega and it is in this range Let's show it it is in this range that it is negative and one can have an attractive interaction. So, once again to repeat it is that this is possible. for the two electrons to bind um, if they can construct a wave function which selectively chooses the frequency the frequency range that is attractive 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 and in fact um, alkali metals like sodium, potassium etcetera alkali metals have very weak electron phonon interaction and hence do not give rise to superconductivity. Okay. 
So now, so this uh, interaction has to be in this regime that is shown here. Uh, and uh, it is usually is as a competition of two terms, one term being necessarily positive and repulsive, which is the screen coulomb term, and the other term which arises because of the electron phonon interaction, uh, the strength of that being m q, but because of a denominator which is a competition between uh, the energy of the pair versus the energy of the, the Debye energy. So, and then since omega is close to omega d, omega is measured from the field Fermi c, omega is close to omega d. If it can happen that omega is less than omega d, then this term the denominator becomes small and negative and then we can have um, um, an attractive interaction and that attractive interaction will actually uh, give rise to superconductivity. But we have not still uh, derived or at least explain that how this uh, interaction term comes from and that can be uh, understood in two different ways. One is that uh, rigorously taking an electron phonon matrix element uh, draw all the diagrams and uh, calculate this term the second term particularly. Uh, there is another way of doing that which is what we are going to do. So, let us uh, do the origin uh, of Okay. Uh, so, we have a scattering between uh, k, k up and a minus k down electron. Uh, so, uh, one could ask the question that why is it that one uh, has uh, one electron has a momentum k, the other electron has a momentum minus k. Uh, it can be shown that uh, with the momentums being chosen in this particular fashion, a two particle state yields the minimum energy, which is the most stable configuration. And uh, for a bound pair to happen, because they are in the same state, we cannot expect a both uh, up up pair to occur or an up uh, down down pair to occur. So, the pairing has to be between up and down. So, these are the momentum and spin of uh, the, the participating uh, electrons which are participating in the bound pair. So, uh, let us see that how uh, this pairing takes place. Now, just to say that it is a spin independent interaction. and so spin index can be dropped. Okay. So, let us see the case 1. The case 1 is that, that there is a direct electron electron interaction, uh, which is facilitated by the Coulomb forces. So, let us consider an initial state. So, this case 1 is Coulomb interaction and it is a direct process. What do I mean by direct process is uh, that there is an initial state i before scattering and there is a final state f after scattering. So, the matrix element of such a electron electron interaction in such a direct process, we just write uh, E E and uh, D I R. Uh, Let us just give a little bit of space here. And this is written as is I H E E. D i r and f and this can be written as exponential i k dot r, which is a, a plane wave initial state and uh, uh, u c that is what we write as coulomb and then 
exponential minus i k prime dot r and the d cube r. So, this is the matrix element and this matrix element. So, k is the incoming uh, uh, state momentum. So, the electron comes with a, a momentum k and leaves with the momentum minus uh, I mean leaves with the momentum k prime. Uh, this minus sign is coming because you are taking a, a ket here uh, whereas, this is a bra here. So, this is exponential i k dot r. So, I, I, we have assumed that both i and f are plane wave states i and f are plane wave states. So, this term cannot give any negative contribution and hence it cannot uh, account for the two electrons to form a bound pair. So, this is positive and hence it is repulsive. So, we are not yet there uh, for getting the attractive interaction. Now, let us look at a case 2 which is an indirect process, it takes place via exchange of phonons and uh, this there is an intermediate process involved and uh, it is a that is why it is a second order process. Uh, remember your second order perturbation theory, where uh, the way it is written is that there is an intermediate uh, there is an initial state and then there is a perturbation and then there is a final state uh, I am sorry there is an intermediate state here and then there is another matrix element and the final state and then here one gets the uh, energy. Uh, so, I uh, minus the intermediate energy square. So, this is the uh, correction let us call it as E 2 in the second order perturbation theory. This is just a result that we are going to use. So, there are two ways that this indirect thing can take place. One is uh, number 1 in which uh, the electron 1 let us just label them even though they are indistinguishable this is for our convenience. So, with momentum k emits a photon which is later reabsorbed by electron 2 with momentum minus k. Let us just say this process once more. So, there is an electron call it electron 1 which has a momentum k it emits a photon which later at a later time the electron 2 absorbs this which had a momentum minus k and this process would be looked upon as this. So, this is the k which is electron number 1 and this is an electron minus k this is electron 2. Uh, this one emits k emits a photon of momentum q so this becomes k plus q and this becomes minus k minus q and because to so this is time axis so this is how time increases and we are particularly you know talking about that so this is the this is how the time grows so, later on when after it emits it gets reabsorbed. 
Now, the same thing can be thought of for the uh, reverse case that is 2 is that electron 2 with momentum k minus k emits a photon which is is later reabsorbed by electron electron 1 with momentum k. So, this is a similar thing, it is just that the uh, alignment of the figure will be a little different. So, there will be k here and it goes like this and now because the process happens in the reverse order. So, we will draw it this way. So, this is electron 1 with k again it is k plus q here and it is uh, minus k and this is minus k minus q. And we are talking about, so this is the again the time so, these are the two possibilities of the indirect process that one emits the photon and the other absorbs it and there is a, a time a delay between that and in principle both can occur and uh, both will have to be considered. Now, you see that in both cases the initial and final states are same. So, let us do this that process 1 uh, process 1 had uh, initial is epsilon i which is 2 psi k which is epsilon k minus mu. Uh, so, psi k is equal to h cross square k square over 2 m minus mu and final is epsilon f which is 2 xi k prime and k prime equal to k plus q. So, that is the uh, that is for the process 1 and similarly for the process 2 it is initial it is psi 1 equal to 2 psi k and f is equal to 2 psi k prime. Uh, well, I not I mean these k's are vector, but uh, we are ignoring it at the moment. And uh, so, even if the initial and the final states are uh, same, I mean the energies are same, uh, but uh, the inter I mean uh, the initial and the final states are same, but the in, uh, intermediate states are different. And let's see the intermediate state. So, for process 1 the intermediate is equal to psi k prime plus psi k plus h cross omega q and for the second one it is equal to psi k plus psi k prime plus h cross omega q. So, energies are still same of the intermediate state, now calculate the 
uh, the matrix elements including these intermediate states. So, H uh, E E indirect by using the same notation as earlier between I and F you have to sum over the intermediate states and it is I H E E indirect let us just write it intermediate and intermediate H E E indirect. Indirect means the exchange of phonons. So, they do not uh, directly interact uh, and F and then there is a square of the matrix element. Now, it is either I or F both of them being the same and the square of that. So, this is gives rise to an intermediate um, I H E E indirect intermediate and half of uh, half and 1 divided by E f minus E int plus 1 by E i plus minus E int uh, and then we have uh, intermediate H E E indirect and f and so on. So, these are simply numbers because these are matrix elements. So, this is uh, summing over over both 1 and 2. So, this is written here it is equal to 1 divided by omega minus omega q, 1 divided by omega plus omega q. So, this becomes equal to 2 omega q divided by omega square minus omega q square and a v c q square which is. So, in, in a sense this exactly looks like the second term that we have gotten with an energy denominator which is here uh, given by this. And uh, if you uh, want how this comes, then you can look at uh, uh, this thing that E f minus E int <coughs> inverse it is equal to 1 divided by 2 xi k prime minus xi k minus xi k prime minus h cross omega q and E i minus E int inverse it is equal to 1 divided by 2 psi k minus psi k prime minus psi k minus h prime omega q and also psi k prime minus psi k has been used as h cross omega q. So, these matrix elements are positive definite this one. However, because of this uh, energy denominator and in that narrow range that we have talked about this could be attractive and hence would give rise to the attractive interaction. Now, let us look at uh, the a two particle wave function. Uh, BCS gap equation. Okay. So, Bloch actually argued lowest energy state for a two particle system. corresponds to 0 total momentum. So, the two electrons have equal and opposite momentum. 
two electrons which are taking part in binding So, we can write down the orbital wave function, it is only the orbital part that we are writing it down to have a R 1 and a R 2 equal to a g k exponential i k dot R 1 exponential minus i k dot R 2, where g k is some uh, weight or the amplitude of the wave function. Now, uh, when we write uh, the full wave function, uh, the orbital part would be symmetric or antisymmetric depending on the spin part being antisymmetric or symmetric, because the full wave function consisting of the orbital part and the spin part will have to be antisymmetric. So, if we choose symmetric for this, then the spin part would be antisymmetric and if we choose uh, antisymmetric part for this, then the spin part would be symmetric. But remember, that uh, we have done this earlier for two uh, spins, we can have four states. Uh, one of them is called as a singlet state, uh, which is an antisymmetric, and uh, the other three are called triplet states, which are symmetric, which means that if you interchange the particles, then the wave function does not change. So, because the spin part for a, a singlet a wave function is antisymmetric. So, the orbital part will choose will be chosen as symmetric. Now, this is also shown uh, that uh, it is generally true for a two particle system that the singlet one has a lower energy. So, we will take a singlet choose a singlet wave function and BCS theory corresponds to singlet pairing. So, we have the singlet wave function as um, a up down a minus a down up and this is antisymmetric. And because uh, this is antisymmetric, the orbital part has to be symmetric. So, we take this um, orbital part as and also we will have to take that uh, k less than uh, I mean k greater than k f, because we are writing down the two particle wave function, which is uh, uh, residing just outside the Fermi surface. So, it is g k uh, and cosine k dot r 1 minus r 2 and then a uh, up down minus a down up. Now, this can be plugged into the call this as equation 1 and uh, this is plugged into the Schrodinger equation. So, this is E minus 2 uh, E k uh, and a g k equal to k prime greater than k f. So, we used a, a v k k prime and a g k prime. So, all these are k's are of course, vectors. So, v k k prime uh, are the matrix elements of the interaction potential. And uh, V k k prime is something that we have seen just a while back, but just to keep our discussion simple, we will take this as a uh, Coulomb term. Uh, or rather uh, you can consider this V r to be um, 
arising from that kind of a, an interaction uh, which is uh, mediated by phonons. So, r is the r is the distance between two electrons with momentum k and distance between two electrons and um, the v, uh, v k k prime of course, it uh, so v k k prime describes uh, scattering uh, of k prime minus k prime uh, to k and minus k. So, we have to solve for this is equation number 2 solve for g k such that such that total energy E is less than 2 E f, so basically that is the condition for a bound pair to exist. It is very hard to do this calculation for uh, uh, a general potential. So, what you can do is that a V k k prime can be taken as a minus V for epsilon f to be uh, smaller than equal to epsilon k k prime and smaller than equal to epsilon f plus h cross omega t. So, this is as we have said earlier that it will be uh, overall negative because uh, mediated by uh, phonons of course, that has to be satisfied by the participating electrons. Uh, they have to choose the energy range where it becomes negative, but suppose it becomes negative and the, the k and k prime for both the electrons would have to lie between epsilon f to epsilon f plus h cross omega t, it is equal to 0 otherwise. Now, with this we have g k if you put it there it becomes equal to a k prime and a g k prime and 2 epsilon k minus e. Now, sum over k So, it becomes 1 over v, this v is the strength of the interaction and uh, uh, we just uh, reiterate that this v could be infinitesimally small, a uh, superconductivity will still occur. So, this is equal to sum over k greater than k f 1 by 2 epsilon k minus e. Now, we can replace the summation by integration and we had to just invoke the density of states but as we have told several times that the superconductivity is a phenomenon that happens very near to the Fermi surface. So, uh, while we convert the sum into an integral, we do not need to take uh, the energy dependence of the density of states, rather we can take the density of states at the Fermi level. So, this is equal to n epsilon f and uh, the integration has to be done not over all energies, but what is the relevant scale is this and then it is 2 epsilon minus e. Uh, this epsilon is a running variable, this uh, capital epsilon is the uh, 2 particle energy, it is n e f once we do the integration it becomes log of uh, 2 epsilon f minus epsilon plus h cross omega d and we have 2 epsilon f minus e. So, that is the uh, equation that one gets and uh, now for conventional superconductors n epsilon f into v is usually of the order of 0 0.3 or less than 0 0.3. So, this is what is meant by the 
weak coupling approximation which demands that n epsilon f v has to be uh, less than 1 or, uh, or maybe much lesser than 1. So, this is weak coupling superconductors. So, then uh, we have 2 divided by n e f into v equal to log of 2 epsilon f minus e plus 2 h cross omega d divided by 2 epsilon f minus e. And now, if I uh, want to free this log, we have a 2 epsilon f minus e plus 2 h cross omega d divided by 2 epsilon f minus e and this has to be exponential 2 divided by n e f into v. And uh, if you solve for e, it becomes equal to, so I can, uh, I can uh, multiply this here and just doing one more step, I would land up with this 2 h cross omega d exponential minus 2 by n uh, e f into v. So, uh, this is the energy of total energy of the two particle system and uh, uh, so this is with respect to if we take it with respect to the Fermi surface of the two electrons this is comes with a negative sign. And this negative sign uh, talks about that the they have a bound they are bound they are in bound state. So, uh, a bound state can form of infinitesimally this is not um, uh, committed to the magnitude of v any magnitude of v would do. So, by an infinitesimal attractive interaction. Also you see that the binding energy is non analytic, it, it comes as an exponential and hence no orders of perturbation theory. can bring this this result. Part perturbation theory in orders or in uh, terms of V the strength of the attractive interaction between the electrons. Uh, the just one more thing that we need to do here is that. Um, so, for the wave function uh, we have the amplitude of the wave function which is g k uh, this is equal to a cosine k dot r divided by 2 psi k plus e prime where a psi k equal to epsilon k minus mu and uh, which is equal to epsilon k minus epsilon f at t equal to 0 and e prime equal to 2 epsilon f minus e which is of course, greater than 0. Uh, so, E prime uh, can now be called as uh, a binding energy. And this uh, k has to be greater than k f. Just a few comments, uh, this weighting factor uh, which is given by 1 divided by psi k plus has a maximum at at uh, 1 over e prime uh, for psi k equal to 0, uh, which are valid or which are applicable for electrons at the Fermi surface. 
and it falls off at positive values of So, if you note that uh, the E prime the binding energy is much smaller than uh, the H cross omega d for n epsilon f to be uh, into v to be less than 1. Uh, so, this uh, makes sure that the detailed behavior of v k k prime is not important. Also, the small energy range allows the estimation of the range of the Cooper pairs which we know is called as the coherence length and that coherence length is given by this is what has been told earlier and this A is of the order of 1 in BCS theory it is of, of the order of 0.8 and that gives a good estimation of the coherence uh, length of the Cooper pair wave function and that uh, matches with the experimental values which are of the order of maybe uh, 3 to 5000 angstrom. So, this is a theory which gave the calculation had given rise to a gap. The main features of the gap is that it is valid for any strength of the electron electron interaction so long is attractive it is a non perturbative the result is non perturbative and hence you cannot do a perturbation theory of any order in order to get this result. And uh, also it allows the estimation of the, uh, the extent of the Cooper pair wave function which is called as the coherence length. 